The same commodity is offered for sale by various sellers. Whoever sells commodities of the same quality most cheaply is sure to drive the other sellers from the field and to secure the greatest market for himself. The sellers therefore fight among themselves for the sales, for the market. Each one of them wishes to sell and to sell as much as possible, and if possible to sell alone to the exclusion of all other sellers. Each one sells cheaper than the other. Thus, there takes place a competition among the sellers which forces down the price of the commodities offered by them. But there is also a competition among the buyers. This, upon its side, causes the price of the profit commodities to rise. Finally, there is competition between the buyers and the sellers. These wish to purchase as cheaply as possible, those to sell as dearly as possible. The result of this competition between buyers and sellers will depend upon the relations between the two above-mentioned camps of competitors, i.e. upon whether the competition in the army of sellers is stronger. Industry leads two great armies into the field against each other, and each of these again is engaged in a battle among its own troops in its own ranks. The army among whose troops there is less fighting carries off the victory over the opposing host. Let us suppose that there are 100 bales of cotton in the market, and at the same time purchases for a thousand bales of cotton. In this case, the demand is ten times greater than the supply. Competition among the buyers, then, will be very strong. Each of them tries to get hold of one bale, if possible, of the whole hundred bales. This example is no arbitrary supposition. In the history of commerce, we have experienced periods of scarcity of cotton when some capitalists united together and sought to buy up not a hundred bales, but the whole cotton supply of the world. In the given case, then, one buyer seeks to drive the others from the field by offering a relatively higher price for the bales of cotton. The cotton sellers, who perceive the troops of the enemy in the most violent contention among themselves, and who therefore are fully assured of the sale of their whole hundred bales, will beware of pulling one another's hair in order to force down the price of cotton at the very moment in which their opponents race with one another to screw it up high. So, all of a sudden, peace reigns in the army of sellers. They stand opposed to the buyers like one man, fold their arms in philosophic contentment, and their claims would find no limit did not the offers of even the most importunate of buyers have a very definite limit. If, then, the supply of a commodity is less than the demand for it, competition among the sellers is very slight, or there may be none at all among them. In the same proportion in which this competition decreases, the competition among the buyers increases. Result? A more or less considerable rise in the prices of commodities. It is well known that the opposite case, with the opposite result, happens more frequently. Great excess of supply over demand, desperate competition among the sellers and a lack of buyers, forced sales of commodities at ridiculously low prices. But what is a rise and what a fall of prices? What is a high and what a low price? A grain of sand is high when examined through a microscope, and a tower is low when compared with a mountain. And if the price is determined by the relation of supply and demand, by what is the relation of supply and demand determined? Let us turn to the first worthy citizen we meet. He will not hesitate one moment, but, 
like Alexander the Great, will cut this metaphysical knot with his multiplication table. He will say to us, if the production of the commodities which I sell has cost me £100, and out of the sale of these goods I make £110, within the year, you understand, that's an honest, sound, reasonable profit. But if in the exchange I receive £120 or £130, that's a higher profit. And if I should get as much as £200, that would be an extraordinary, an enormous profit. What is it, then, that serves this citizen as the standard of his profit? The cost of the production of his commodities. If, in exchange for these goods, he receives a quantity of other goods whose production has cost less, he has lost. If he receives in exchange for his goods a quantity of other goods whose production has cost more, he has gained. And he reckons the falling or rising of the profit according to the degree at which the exchange value of his goods stands, whether above or below his zero, the cost of production. We have seen how the changing relation of supply and demand causes now a rise, now a fall of prices, now high, now low prices. If the price of a commodity rises considerably owing to a failing supply or a disproportionately growing demand, then the price of some other commodity must have fallen in proportion. For of course, the price of a commodity only expresses in money the proportion in which other commodities will be given in exchange for it. If, for example, the price of a yard of silk rises from two to three shillings, the price of silver has fallen in relation to the silk, and in the same way the prices of all other commodities whose prices have remained stationary have fallen in relation to the price of silk. A large quantity of them must be given in exchange in order to obtain the same amount of silk. Now, what will be the consequence of a rise in the price of a particular commodity? A mass of capital will be thrown into the prosperous branch of industry, and this immigration of capital into the provinces of the favoured industry will continue until it yields no more than the customary profits, or rather, until the price of its products, owing to overproduction, sinks below the cost of production. Conversely, if the price of a commodity falls below its cost of production, then capital will be withdrawn from the production of this commodity. Except in the case of a branch of industry which has become obsolete and is therefore doomed to disappear, the production of such a commodity, that is, its supply, will, owing to this flight of capital, continue to decrease until it corresponds to the demand. And the price of the commodity rises again to the level of its cost of production, or rather, until the supply has fallen below the demand, and its price has risen above its cost of production. For the current price of the commodity is always either above or below its cost of production. We see how capital continually emigrates out of the province of one industry and immigrates into that of another. The high price produces an excessive immigration, and the low price an excessive emigration. We could show, from another point of view, how not only the supply but also the demand is determined by the cost of production. But this would lead us too far away from our subject. We have just seen how the fluctuations of supply and demand always bring the price of a commodity back to its cost of production. The actual price of a commodity, indeed, stands always above or below the cost of production, but the rise and fall reciprocally balance each other, so that, within a certain period of time, if the ebbs and flows of the industry are reckoned up together, the commodities will be exchanged for one another in accordance with their cost of production. Their price is thus determined by their cost of production. The determination of price by the cost of production is not to be understood in the sense of the bourgeois economists. The economists say that the average price of commodities equals the cost of production, that is the law. The anarchic movement, in which the rise is compensated for by a fall and the fall by a rise, they regard as an accident. We might just as well consider the fluctuations as the law and the determination of the price by the cost of production as an accident, as is, in fact, done by certain other economists. But it is precisely these fluctuations which, viewed more closely, carry the most frightful devastation in their train, and, 
like an earthquake, cause bourgeois society to shake to its very foundations. It is precisely these fluctuations that force the price to conform to the cost of production. In the totality of this disorderly movement is to be found its order. In the course of this industrial anarchy, in this circular movement, competition balances, as it were, the one extravagance by the other. We thus see that the price of a commodity is indeed determined by its cost of production, but in such a manner that the periods in which the price of these commodities rises above the costs of production are balanced by the periods in which it sinks below the cost of production, and vice versa. Of course, this does not hold good for a single given product of an industry, but only for that branch of industry. So also, it does not hold good for an individual manufacturer, but only for the whole class of manufacturers. The determination of price by cost of production is tantamount to the determination of price by the labour time requisite to the production of a commodity, for the cost of production consists first of raw materials and wear and tear of tools, etc., i.e., of certain industrial products whose production has cost a certain number of work days, which therefore represent a certain amount of labour time, and secondly, of direct labour, which is also measured by its duration. End of chapter 3.